Some movies are known for their artistic excellence and their creative innovation, others for being so terrible, so infamous for the horrors of their production that it is hard to believe they exist at all. An epic tragedy of historic proportions, is there a record for how many careers a single movie can ruin? Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the history of Super Mario Brothers the movie. Super Mario Bros. is a live-action movie released in 1993 that is very loosely based on the Nintendo game of the same name. It is the first feature film adaptation of the game, and while it wasn't the last, it was the last for a very long time. 65 million years ago, the dinosaurs were living their best lives until a meteor changed things for what seemed like forever. Because it was a meteor of unusual power and origin that not only killed the majority of life on the planet, but broke reality, sending some of the dinosaurs into a parallel dimension where they evolved along very similar lines to humans. Fast forward to Brooklyn, New York in the 1990s, Mario and Luigi are brothers doing their best to scrape together enough work for their plumbing business to keep their heads above water. They soon find themselves trying to protect Daisy, a university student, and her dinosaur dig site from frequent foe Anthony Scapelli and his construction company who want the site abandoned, regardless of its historic importance, so they can begin developing it. But before the matter can be resolved, Daisy is kidnapped by two goons who are clearly not totally human. On behalf of President Koopa, the authoritarian leader of the dinosaur dimension, the goons have been stealing human girls in an attempt to find the lost princess, who holds a shard of the meteorite that can activate the full power of the meteorite and merge the two dimensions together, allowing Koopa and his army to rule both dimensions as one. Mario and Luigi follow Daisy through the warp zone where they find a world of evolved dinosaurs, oppression, and an invasive fungus threatening to choke the life out of the city. It's going to take more than a plumber's helper to figure all this crap out. Thank you to Factor for sponsoring this video. Click the link in the description below and use code GALAXY50 for 50% off your first box and free wellness shots for life today. You can't skip lunch. Well, you can, but you shouldn't. All right, you can, but I can't. I mean, I can, but I shouldn't. It's too important and... I like lunch. Factor makes sure that time and cost don't prevent me from having a hot meal with fresh ingredients. And their convenient deliveries save me the trip to the grocery store, or worse, the trip to the vending machine. Factor has snacks, smoothies, and more. A variety of easy options for the entire day, like breakfast, midday bites, and more. All of that in a flexible schedule that works for you. Get as much or as little as you need by choosing 6 to 18 meals per week. Plus, you can pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is now owned by HelloFresh, and with a wider array of meal plans to choose from, there's something for everyone. It's easy to switch between the brands to make your meal planning even easier. Head to Factor75.com or click the link below and use code GALAXY50 to get 50% off your first Factor box and free wellness shots for life today. Two free wellness shots from three available flavors for every order while you're an active subscriber. That's Factor75.com, code GALAXY50, and thanks again to Factor. This isn't the history of Mario as a character, but you should know that he made his debut fighting Donkey Kong in 1981, got a starring role alongside his brother Luigi and Mario Brothers in 1983, and in late 1985, early 1986, Super Mario Brothers was the marquee launch title for the Nintendo Entertainment System in the US, cementing the characters and the system as pop culture and entertainment icons. They pop the cartridge into this deck, which attaches to any television set. These controls direct the characters. The better your eye-hand coordination, the better you do. Never has there been a toy that's been this successful. This is as big or bigger than anything the toy industry has ever seen. Um, I'll, I'll give you one comparison. A Barbie, which is an institution, uh, does about a half a billion dollars a year. Nintendo does over three times as much. After selling nearly 9 million Super Mario Bros. cartridges in the U.S., Nintendo released the sequel, Super Mario Bros. 2, in October of 1988, and then capitalized on that popularity across media by licensing Mario and other Nintendo properties for use in the Super Mario Show animated series produced by Deke Entertainment in September, and the feature film The Wizard produced by Universal Studios in December. The Wizard did nearly $15 million against a budget of $6 million. Nintendo received a cool $100,000 from Universal for the brand rights, but no real creative input, which was fine because they didn't really want any. Despite acting as a feature-length advertisement for the Nintendo brand, The Wizard wasn't creatively ambitious. If Nintendo was disappointed about anything, it was that The Wizard wasn't more of a spectacle. Bill White, head of advertising and public relations for Nintendo of America, kicked off 1990 by urging his boss, Nintendo of America president Minoru Arakawa, to strike while the pipes were hot. Ow! 
and get a movie based on Mario Brothers into production. The market was ripe for the adaptation of popular kids' entertainment brands as live-action movies. Heck, The Wizard might have had even more pop culture impact if it wasn't for Batman. Batman, who ruled the box office in the second half of 1989, dominated the public consciousness and, more importantly, all the licensed merchandise dollars. The second Super Mario sequel game, Super Mario Bros. 3, which debuted in The Wizard, was released in February of 1990. In March, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was adapted as a feature film and, like Batman, ruled the box office, dominated the public consciousness, and all the licensed merchandise dollars. Batman and Ninja Turtles succeeded as if a secret code was cracked, as if a formula was established for how audiences would accept the adaptation of kids' entertainment brands that could be replicated with Mario. Realism, sorry, realism worked. Characters grounded in the real world, despite the ridiculous fantasy and science fiction elements throughout. To a casual observer, Super Mario's world was no weirder than that of the human-sized anthropomorphic martial arts reptiles who battled hordes of ninja robots led by octopus brain monsters across dimensions. Nintendo of America listened to pitches for a Mario movie. To them, it wasn't so much about the accuracy of the adaptation as it was the allure of the experiment, the power of the exposure. Nearly every studio took a shot, but it wasn't until Roland Jaffe and Jake Eberts suggested a more realistic approach to platforming the plumber that Nintendo committed to the deal. Jaffe was a director in the process of pivoting to producer. He was known for films like 1984's Oscar-winning The Killing Fields about ethnic cleansing in Cambodia during the reign of Pol Pot, and 1989's Fat Man and Little Boy about the development, construction, and testing of atomic bombs during World War II. Eberts was a producer on films like 1981's Chariots of Fire and Escape from New York, Gandhi, The Adventures of Baron Munchausen, and Dances with Wolves. Once you started off with Mario and Luigi and what Mario and Luigi meant, then the natural process is the world they go into and, and who inhabits that world. We had a, a tremendously rich tapestry of characters to work from in the game itself. So the trick was here to try and get those characters to come, come to life and to integrate them into a story which made some sense that had a beginning, middle, and end. Whether Nintendo actually loved their pitch or not, they believed Jaffe and his company, Light Motive, would deliver a finished film. Light Motive was only a year old at the time, which not only gave Nintendo more creative control should they decide to leverage it, but also confidence that Mario would be Light Motive's only priority. Nintendo sold the rights to Light Motive in October of 1990 for $2 million, a discounted rate based partially on the fact that Nintendo retained all the merchandise rights. To say that the other studios were shocked would be an understatement, but that shock quickly turned to relief as Light Motive began production on Super Mario Bros. Adapting Super Mario Bros. into a movie was uncharted territory. Some movies, like 1981's Tron, told stories about video games and the virtual world that might exist inside. But as of 1990, there had never been a direct adaptation of a video game into a feature film, and certainly not in live action. For better or worse, Super Mario Bros. as a game barely had any kind of plot, and what plot it did have was spelled out in supplemental materials as opposed to the game itself. The kingdom of the peaceful mushroom people are invaded by the Koopa, a tribe of turtles who use magic. The mushroom people are transformed into objects like bricks and plants. The only one who can undo the spell is Princess Toadstool, daughter of the Mushroom King, but she's been taken prisoner by the great Koopa Turtle King, aka Bowser. That's it! In 1989, Deke's Super Mario Bros. Super Show set up their own origin story, with Mario and Luigi stumbling into the Mushroom Kingdom after locating a warp zone in a bathtub drain. That's it! No character development, no life story, no interpersonal conflict, no drama. Just a premise that wasn't even essential to playing the game. In March of 1991, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2 The Secret of the Ooze hit theaters as the first Super Mario Bros. script was delivered to Jaffe and Eberts, written by Barry Morrow. Morrow, who won an Oscar for 1988's Rain Man. While it is archived and not publicly accessible, what we do know about the first draft is that it was nicknamed Drain Man by the production as a joke. It had some general similarities to Morrow's Oscar-winning screenplay in that it was about two brothers on the road. Characters in contrast, one the practical down-to-earth type, the other a savant, together learning about life and each other while they go on an adventure. Now. A disclaimer before we go forward that the timeline gets a little muddy. Even for the people who were involved, the specific order of events between March of 1991 and the release of the film in March of 1993 is uncertain. There's a very good reason for all of this, of course. Chaos. Nearly every technical role on the production side changed at least once, including the most important positions like director and writer. Writers. Lots of writers. Call it lack of communication, lack of experience, lack of a clearly defined vision. Co-producer Jaffe said it himself in his pitch meeting to Nintendo, I was improvising. 
Nintendo didn't love Morrow's script, and Morrow preferred to depart the project rather than compromise his vision. Instead, Jim Genowine and Tom S. Parker took on the next draft and turned up the focus on Mario and Luigi's relationship while leaning more into fantasy. Meanwhile, Greg Beeman was hired to direct. Beeman was a young and upcoming director, having worked on television with The Wonder Years and made his feature film debut with 1988's License to Drive. However, when his most recent film, Mom and Dad Save the World, tanked at the box office in 1992, and it was clear that Light Motive wouldn't be able to get funding from distributors with Beeman in charge, he was removed from Super Mario Bros. Co-producer Jaffe recognized they needed to bring in someone with a new and distinct vision for the project. As he tells the story, quote, We made some mistakes. We tried some various avenues that didn't work. I felt the project was taking a wrong turn. And that's when I began thinking of Max Headroom. This isn't the history of Max Headroom, but you should know that Max was a television character created in 1985 by George Stone and husband and wife duo Rocky Morton and Annabelle Jankel. Portrayed by actor Matt Frewer, in prosthetics, Max existed in the digital realm. Depending on the context, Max was either an AI reconstruction of journalist Edison Carter in a dystopian cyberpunk world fighting against corrupt corporations with authoritarian aspirations, a late-night talk show host, or a celebrity spokesperson for Coca-Cola. Jaffe set up a meeting with Max's creators, husband and wife team, Morton and Jankel, all the way in Europe. They were interested and pitched him their concept for what a Super Mario Brothers movie could be. And the first question that came up in our minds was, where did it all come from and why did it happen? And as soon as we started asking those questions, everything seemed to slot into place. And then that sparked off this whole thing about dinosaurs and that um, uh, their extinction and why dinosaurs aren't around anymore. The story is very much based around uh, the themes of extinction. And we figured, well, maybe um, the punishment that they receive in, in this world is they get regressed back to their ancestors, all the way back to any stage of the last 200 million years of, of evolution. Jaffe was sold, and they were all on the same page with this new film following in the footsteps of recent kids' entertainment franchise adaptations like Batman and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Their story would be a prequel to the game, establishing all the key players and explaining why all these ridiculous fantasy elements were tied together. Nintendo approved the hiring of Morton and Jenkel despite reservations about their lack of feature film experience. Their vision for a darker reality combined with their record of creating subversive entertainment for the MTV generation was at least a definitive vision. Worst case scenario, Nintendo had final say if things went wrong. In August of 1991, Nintendo's new flagship console, the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, launched in the U.S. with Super Mario World as a marquee title. Bowser once again takes Princess Peach prisoner, this time in Dinosaur Land. Mario and Luigi must traverse the dangerous world with the help of their newly hatched friend Yoshi, a green dinosaur that Mario can ride like a horse. In October, a new script better suited for the visual style and narrative sensibilities of Morton and Jenkel was written by Parker Bennett and Terry Runty. Fresh off their 1991 dark comedy Mystery Date, Bennett and Runty pushed Mario into sci-fi, raised the stakes for the characters, peppered in some more humor, some horror, and found a way to imperil our world in the process. Nintendo approved, but directors Morton and Jenkel did not. According to the book Console Wars, they quote, deemed this latest script to be too blah and had the writers amp it up to be more like Ghostbusters, larger than life, comedic, and centered around a snarky Bill Murray type. From Hollywood Pictures. You must be the great Cooper. He controlled half the universe. Guy in charge. But he wanted more. Get me the rock! Come and get it, Lizard Breath! Now, two plumbers from Brooklyn plumbers. must find the power to stop him. I'll kill that plumber! Super Mario Brothers, rated PG parental guidance suggested. Starts Friday, May 28th at a theater near you. Dustin Hoffman won an Oscar for his portrayal of Ray Babbitt in Rain Man. He had the chops to play a cartoonish, flamboyant character like Captain Hook, and he wanted to play Mario in Super Mario Brothers. It was a perfect fit for everyone, except Nintendo. Aww, you sure? To land Hoffman would raise the profile, the legitimacy of the film. Bill White, head of advertising and public relations for Nintendo of America, urged his boss, Nintendo of America president Minoru Arakawa, to strike while the pipes were hot. Ow! White had a meeting with Hoffman. Everyone is excited about it, except for Nintendo of America president Arakawa, who said he didn't think Hoffman was right for the part. And that was the end of it.
Danny DeVito was considered as both Mario and a potential director, but he declined. Tom Hanks said he would commit for $5 million of the $40 million budget. Still known for comedy, Nintendo wasn't sure he was right either. Could Tom Hanks headline a summer blockbuster? Could Tom Hanks handle the drama of a Super Mario Brothers movie? Nintendo backed away, but continued to pursue Arnold Schwarzenegger and Michael Keaton as potential Bowsers. In February of 1992, Bennett and Runty delivered a new draft that swung toward humor given the previous consideration for Tom Hanks or a Bill Murray type. It scaled down the effects because several million dollars had already been spent and there was almost nothing to show for it. But that draft was also set aside now that Bob Hoskins was in consideration for Mario and there was mounting pressure to get cameras rolling. Each new draft was increasingly constrained by the need to incorporate props, costumes, and set pieces that were already produced for outdated versions of the story. Yet another team of writers were brought in, Dick Clement and Ian Lafrenet, a longtime British writing duo known for their BBC television comedies. They were hired to take a pass at the script and delivered their first draft in early March. It was a bit too die-hard derivative for Nintendo, but another draft by Clement and Lafrenet in late March finally found a balance of realism, action, humor, and science fiction that nearly all parties approved. Confidence was high enough to send that script out to actors to get contracts signed. As Bennett said in a 2010 interview on the Super Mario Brothers movie archive, quote, that's what got people like Fiona Shaw on board. It was a much more character-oriented draft, and they were working on that. I think they probably contributed more than I gave them credit for, at least in terms of tightening things up and shifting the basic structure around. Nintendo finally got their Mario with Bob Hoskins, John Leguizamo as Luigi, Dennis Hopper as President Koopa, Samantha Mathis as Princess Daisy, Fiona Shaw as Lena, and Frank Yoshi and the Goombas Welker as the voices of Yoshi and the Goombas. But that wasn't the end of the writer's merry-go-round or even the final version of the script. Light Motive was a brand new independent company. The entire thing was being financed on a tiny budget. In an effort to get the rest of the budget they needed, the producers looked to the bigger distributors to buy in. To that end, the Walt Disney Company, through their subsidiary Buena Vista Pictures, came on board. That was when the biggest revisions occurred. Jaffe and Eberts hired Ed Solomon and Ryan Rowe without the approval of directors Morton and Jangle to rewrite the film that would make sure to get the approval of Disney and their millions of dollars. Again, Bennett in that same interview from 2010, quote, it was totally Ed Solomon who did the shooting draft. Most of the dialogue and the final shape of the movie was from Ed, and I think Ryan Rowe worked with him for a while. And I know he had to do it in a ridiculously short amount of time. It was like he pulled a three-day, stay-up-all-night kind of thing, and he did it within probably 10 days to get the shooting script done. Morton and Janko were not happy about the rewrites and considered walking away. The new Solomon script was like the meteorite in their story, splitting two worlds apart. Their gritty, witty reality, whose heart was the unusual relationship of Mario and Luigi, as brothers forced into father and son roles due to their own lived tragedy was now full of cartoonish sight gags. In a 2014 Nintendo Life interview, Morton said the new script was, quote, so different that it didn't apply to a lot of the sets and the characters, and all the actors had read and signed up for the original script, and this new script came in, which was much more full of gags and sort of childlike, and they didn't like it very much. So I had to sort of defend the script, and I didn't like it either, and encourage them to carry on, and it was very awkward and uneasy and difficult. Morton said it was so different that it changed their shooting schedule, forcing them to work on sets that weren't even finished yet. In some cases, it was so bad it dictated where he could actually put the camera so they wouldn't show the unfinished parts. He said it through the film into chaos. Human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, that's his power. When it was time to roll cameras, the actors didn't even recognize the scripts they were given. It wasn't the project they had committed to. Production panicked and tried to bring Clement and Lafrenet back in to rewrite the script closer to what they had submitted to appease the cast. When they weren't available, production went back one more generation and brought Bennett and Runty back in to try to repair the draft that replaced the draft that replaced their drafts. Oh! How deep does this go, Wakamba? Then and Runty were on set, working with the actors, scene by scene, writing new dialogue while the shoots were happening. The directors blamed the producers. The producers blamed the directors. The actors blamed the directors. The writers blamed the producers. Several members of the cast stopped reading new pages as they were handed out. Revisions were so fast and so frequent that it was a waste of time to prepare. Until they were in costume, on set, and the cameras were ready to roll, what was the point? 
As Morton and Jenkel tell the story, they were just doing their best to manage a situation they no longer wanted to be a part of. To some of the cast and crew, they were fools who didn't have the skill, experience, or competence to handle the scale of the production. In fact, the LA Times visited the set during production to speak with the cast and crew to get a sense of how things were going. Dennis Hopper was candid in his response, saying, quote, the directors won't give interviews? That's the smartest thing I've heard from them. That's the only intelligent thing I've heard that they've really actually done. Principal photography for Super Mario Brothers ran from May through July of 1992 on location in New York City and in an abandoned cement factory in Wilmington, North Carolina that doubled as downtown Dino Hatton. Bigger, better, and with more existing industrial structure than they could have created in a soundstage, the cement factory facilitated the multi-tiered streets and allowed them to incorporate some of the existing elements into the harsh dinosaur world, an esteemed legacy as the cement factory was previously used as the Foot Clan's hideout in 1990's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Creature designs like Yoshi and the Goombas came from Patrick Totopoulos, who producer Greg informs me is the guy who designed Godzilla in the 1998 Godzilla movie starring Matthew Broderick. Morton and Janko liked his Goombas so much much, they expanded their role in the film, if you know what I mean. With such a high-profile, high-demand property like Super Mario Brothers, there was no way to keep the chaos secret and word spread fast. Especially once the LA Times ran the story full of quotes from people on set that we have used as reference in this very video. The article was so damning that Morton and Jankel were barred from the- uh, okay. Okay. My Goombas. <laughs> The article was so damning that Morton and Jenkel were barred from the editing studio. Their agents dropped them and every other agency steered clear. Reshoots were scheduled to add more action, but Morton and Jenkel were not welcome. And finally, an animated prologue was added to the film at the last minute to help clarify the disjointed action that the audience was about to be exposed to. Super Mario Brothers opened in the US May 28th, 1993, bringing in less than $10 million through the weekend, putting it squarely in fourth place behind Cliffhanger, Made in America, and Dave. By the end of its run in theaters, it made just under $21 million total. Not even half its reported production budget of around $48 million. It was the 74th place movie of 1993 right behind Coneheads, but just ahead of another stakeout. Many reviewers found it hard to ignore the bifurcated nature of the production, with the LA Times' Michael Wilmington saying, quote, It's a movie split in two, wildly accomplished on one level, wildly deficient on another. Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert gave it two thumbs down, naming it one of the worst of 1993's. Super Mario Brothers was doomed at the conception level. The graphics are as listless as the humans. You have to constantly say to yourself, see, they're supposed to be the video game characters. That's not funny in and of itself. I think that this actually was a very troubled movie. They had a lot of trouble with the special effects, and they should have taken more trouble with the screenplay, because obviously, when they went into this project, on paper, they didn't have anything that anybody would ever want to see, and I think they probably thought maybe the special effects would save it. Nintendo made the shrewd decision to retain all the merchandising rights, and that's more important when you're making a big budget feature film based on a kid's entertainment brand. That said, if the movie doesn't do well, it doesn't matter how good the toys are or who makes them, you aren't going to move a lot of plastic. Ertl released a full line of action figures, vehicles, and playsets including Mario and Luigi, Goomba, Spike, and President Koopa. You can get a crash action police car or the Devo chamber itself to remind you why the Goomba's heads were so tiny compared to their bodies. There were 12-inch talking Mario and Luigi dolls, Skybox released trading cards, there were lunchboxes, clothing, coloring books, and since it was 1993, Pogs. Pogs. I don't know why I said it weird like that. Pogs. <laughs> There has never been any official sequel or any kind of continuation of the 1993 Super Mario Bros. cinematic universe. That said, in 2013, Stephen Applebaum and Ryan Haas, editors of the Super Mario Bros. movie archive, worked with writer Parker Bennett to develop an unofficial webcomic picking up where the movie left off. Bennett provided a general sense of the world and where they could potentially have gone with the characters. And from there, Applebaum and Haas, along with art by Eric Donovan, told a story that saw Mario and Luigi going back to the dinosaur realm to help Princess Daisy fight the mad scientist Wart. Super Mario Bros. was released on Laserdisc in December of 1993 and VHS in January of 1994. It hit DVD in 2003 and again in 2010. In 2021, an unofficial restoration of a longer cut sourced from a VHS work print was put together by Garrett Gilcrest and members of the Super Mario Bros. movie archive. 20 minutes longer than the film as released in theaters, it contains another devolving scene, more conflict between Mario and the contractor Scapelli, and a rap by Spike and Iggy at the Boom Boom Bar. A 30th anniversary region-free collector's edition Blu-ray in 4K was released in February of 2024 and includes a restored version of the work print dubbed the Lasagna Cut. As of this video, Super Mario Bros. is not currently available to stream in the U.S. 
There was a lot of heat after the movie inevitably bombed and plenty of blame to go around, but fair or not, most of it landed on directors Morton and Jankel. Bob Hoskins famously said in a 2007 Guardian article that Super Mario Brothers was, quote, a f nightmare. The whole experience was a nightmare. It had a husband and wife team directing whose arrogance had been mistaken for talent. After so many weeks, their own agent told them to get off the set. F nightmare. F idiots. Dennis Hopper in 2008 for the AV Club said, quote, it was a nightmare, very honestly, that movie. It was a husband and wife directing team who were both control freaks and wouldn't talk before they made decisions. Anyway, I was supposed to go down there for five weeks, and I was there for 17. It took Morton and Jenkel a while to regain their footing, opting to start their own production company called MJZ when no one wanted to work with them. MJZ took them back to working on television commercials and eventually rebuilt their reputations. MJZ has won industry awards, and Jenkel has had a prolific career as a solo director. Nintendo got out of the movie business for a long time, not even trying to get any of their other beloved properties to screen, even when the Marvel and DC cinematic universes were dominating the box office in a way that Batman and the Ninja Turtles could only have dreamed of back in 1990. But Mario did finally make his way back to theaters last year in 2023 in an animated movie that had the benefit of nearly 30 years of additional character development through games, cartoons, and comics. And an understanding that they weren't trying to break any new ground with their script or adaptation, just get the thing that people recognize on screens and charge them money. If Super Mario Bros. is guilty of anything, it's making dinosaurs cold-blooded. In their defense, Jurassic Park was released two weeks after Super Mario opened. They didn't know. If Super Mario Bros. is guilty of anything else, it's that it didn't know what it wanted to be. Was it an adult film channeling movies like Blade Runner, Robocop, and Total Recall? Or was it a kid's movie like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3? No one sets out to make a bad movie, but bad movies do happen. Bob Hoskins may have been embarrassed by his appearance in Super Mario Brothers, but his son Jack wasn't. When it was released, Jack was old enough to care about Mario, but not old enough to care about how movies were made. In 2013, Jack asked movie fans around the world to maintain perspective about adaptations of the things they loved as children, saying, quote, I was quite offended when most fans say it's the worst video game movie of all time, but I truly appreciate their feelings. I believe Joel Schumacher once said when he directed Batman and Robin, if I disappointed them in any way, then I really want to apologize because that wasn't my intention. My intention was just entertainment. So if there's anyone reading this, please understand that it's no one's intention to ruin the classics. If you remember your past enjoyments, then it would definitely keep your childhood memories alive and safely locked in your head forever. Thanks for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. If you're in the position to help the channel grow, if you'd like early access to the videos ad-free, as well as behind-the-scenes features, sneak peeks at upcoming projects, and exclusive monthly podcasts about the show, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toygalaxy. We have a new shop for all your Secret Galaxy t-shirt print pin needs. Check that out at secretgalaxy.shop. All merchandise is physically in stock and ready to ship, and let us know in the comments down below where Super Mario Brothers ranks on your favorite games of all time and favorite movies of all time. For me, the game is 74th, and ironically, the movie is 74th as well. Despite the fact that I was working as an usher at the movie theater when it was released, I watched it all the way through for the first time for this video, and I gotta say, it's not as bad as I was led to believe. They had an idea, they did their best. It's not necessarily what I would have done, but they didn't ask me. That said, if Nintendo's watching, we've got some ideas we'd like to share with you. Maybe not for Mario, but give us one of your other characters, Excite Bike, Bionic Commando, Rad Gravity. Rad Gravity. Yeah. Cut.